Hello. In the last video, we looked at the foundations of punctuated equilibrium. In this video, we're going to examine some of the criticisms, of which there are many. Uh, one critique, suggested by Levinton and Simon, is that punctuated equilibrium is theoretically empty or trivial. Now, to understand their critique, we need to think a little bit about species. One of the central questions in, uh, in, in biology is how to define species. What exactly is a species? This is known as the species problem. And if you're interested, I've got a couple of videos on this problem, so you can go and look them up. But very briefly, the standard definition of species in evolutionary theory comes from Ernst Mayer, and it's known as the biological species concept. Mayer defines species in terms of reproductive isolation. So species is a group of organisms that can interbreed with each other, but that can't interbreed with any other organisms. Uh, so uh, what makes two different kinds of dog the same species is that if they were to mate with each other, they would produce fertile offspring. What makes a human and a chimpanzee different species is that if they tried to mate, they wouldn't produce any offspring. Uh, there's a whole bunch of problems with, with this definition. Again, watch my video if you're interested. But it is a, a very nice, straightforward account, and it's um, pretty widely accepted. Uh, but, but there's an obvious problem applying it in paleontology, because all we have is a fossil record. And how are we supposed to know whether two similar fossils were reproductively isolated from one another? So paleontologists tend to classify species uh, according to the only reliable information they have about them, which is their morphology. Morphology concerns the, the form and features of organisms, as I mentioned, I think, in the last video. So if you look at the fossil of a snail, you can... Uh, you can determine how big it was, you can determine the conicity of its shell, the structure of spirals on the shell, you can see its texture, whether it was smooth or bumpy, and so on. We classify species based on their morphological features. Levington and Simon use this point to present the tautology problem. So recall that a central claim of punctuated equilibrium is that species exist in stasis during their lifetimes. And by stasis, we mean that they undergo very little morphological change. Uh, the morphology of a species at its extinction is pretty much the same as it was at its birth. Can you see the problem here? In paleontology, species are distinguished based on their morphological features. So we class two specimens as different species just in case their morphologies are different. In which case, how could we ever show that significant change has occurred during the lifetime of a species? How is it even possible to show that? Uh, I mean, obviously, what we would have to do is find two specimens of the same species that have significantly different morphologies. But if we did find two specimens with significantly different morphologies, they would be classed as different species just by definition, because morphology is how paleontologists distinguish species. So it follows that uh, stasis is, is true. Um, species do indeed exhibit very little morphological train, change. But this truth is completely trivial. It's, it's, it's a tautology. It's just a, a necessary consequence of how paleontologists classify species. So it's rather like the claim, all bachelors are unmarried. All bachelors are unmarried is perfectly true. It's necessarily true. But it doesn't tell us anything uh, about the world because its truth is just a matter of definition. Um, bachelor is defined to mean unmarried man. There's no possible state of affairs in which all bachelors are unmarried is false. So the, um, the charge is that it, the same situation applies uh, with, with species and stasis. Species are necessarily in stasis. Uh, I, I don't think this is really a serious issue. Um, punctuated equilibrium ultimately is it describes a pattern of macroevolution and we can test this pattern without talking about species. So uh, um, what sort of pattern are we looking for? Well we'd be looking for very rapid emergence of a new kind of form followed by the stasis of that form. We don't have to talk about species, um, just talk about emergence of a particular morphology over thousands of years followed by stasis for millions of years. In other words this sort of pattern. Uh, we saw this image in the last video. This plots some um, shell shape over time. Uh, if we saw this, you know, if we saw one form giving rise to uh, two forms and, and then both forms remain in stasis, we have punctuated equilibrium. 
I mean, I think Levinson and Simon do suggest an important point that it suggests we have to be careful when judging punctuated equilibrium. Uh, we have to, have to be careful when judging stasis. But I think it's it's far too strong to say that the theory is trivial. I mean, this kind of pattern is obviously not trivial, and it, it's um, you know that's that's clearly a substantial claim about the world to say that this is the kind of pattern of macroevolution. Okay, so assuming that punctuated equilibrium does in fact make substantial claims and isn't simply trivial, one of the main concerns uh, about it has been whether it's really possible to test it. Some people have suggested that it, it, it isn't testable. Now, first of all, uh, Gould and Eldridge probably didn't do themselves any favours on this point, because in their original paper they explicitly say that punctuated equilibrium is uh, simply another way of interpreting the fossil record and that it can't be confirmed by empirical evidence. Uh, punctuated equilibrium is sort of just a way of seeing the fossil record. Um, phyletic gradualism is a, one other way of seeing the fossil record. So here's an explicit quote regarding punctuated equilibrium versus phyletic gradualism. They say, the data of paleontology cannot decide which picture is more accurate. So, so that's pretty straightforward, pretty explicit. In their first paper, their whole case rests on the claim that punctuated equilibrium accords much better with the standard account of speciation, uh, as we saw in the last video. So they, they argue that that's why we should adopt the theory. But we can't actually demonstrate it by appealing to the fossil record. Uh, maybe the situation is best captured by this famous optical illusion. You can see this uh, as both a young woman or an old woman, depending on your perspective. If you can't see both of them here, maybe this, this might help. This is the young woman. Um, she's got her head turned away from us, and I've put her ear in red. Um, that might help you get the right perspective there. Um, and this is the old woman with her head side on. So that's her eye, that's her mouth, that's her nose. Um, now, suppose this image was used to illustrate a story about a witch. Well, in that case, it would make sense to look at it as the old woman. Um, but if somebody said, no, no, I, uh, it's the young woman, they insisted on seeing it as a young woman, there's no way of showing that they're wrong. It's possible to see it as a young woman. That might be more difficult to reconcile with the witch story, but you can interpret it that way if you like. Similarly, what Gold and Eldridge argued is that Punctuated equilibrium provides a better theory in many respects, but somebody who insists on phyletic gradualism can't be proven wrong by the data of the fossil record. They can always see the fossil record as being consistent with phyletic gradualism. Uh, the reason is that gradualists can simply appeal to arguments like the incompleteness of the fossil record. Gradualists can always say that, uh, in fact, there's a lot of gradual change, it just tends to be lost for various reasons. Um, I think that Gould and Eldridge really sold themselves short here. If punctuated equilibrium isn't testable, then it can't claim much power as a scientific theory. Testability is one of the fundamental parts of science. If a theory isn't testable, that's a good reason to reject it. And I think that their original paper does undermine its testability. I mean, they explicitly say that the fossil record can't decide between punctuated equilibrium and phyletic gradualism. Um, and given that these are claims about macroevolution, the fossil record is pretty much the only way of testing them. Um, however, many other defenders of punctuated equilibrium have argued that it, that it is testable. Uh, Gould and Eldridge themselves later changed their minds and argued for its testability. Uh, indeed, they argued that it, it's not just been tested, but it's been amply confirmed. But when you look at their original paper, you, I think you can see why many people felt a bit uneasy about their theory. In any case, there have been other concerns about the testability of punctuated equilibrium. So, so second, uh, the fossil record provides only a very small sample of um, morphological traits. Only the harder parts of an organism tend to be preserved. So uh, if you're looking at animals, for instance, you're only going to find the skeletons. What this means is that there could be a great deal of change that we simply don't see. If we judge a species by changes in its skeletal form, this could give us the illusion of stasis, because various other parts might undergo significant change, um, but that just isn't recorded. So we have this problem testing stasis, because the fact that fossils display stasis doesn't entail that the, the organisms overall were in morphological stasis. This problem is especially pressing, since um, 
we might expect that change is more likely to occur in fleshy parts rather than in skeletons that define the basic body plans. Uh, for instance, the colour patterns on a bird are, are probably much more likely to change than its basic skeletal form. Skeletons are among uh, the more conservative features. One of my favourite examples of morphological conservatism is to contrast the skeletons of theropod dinosaurs like uh, the T-Rex and the Velociraptor with the skeletons of modern day birds. I've just looked some up on, on Google, check out a Velociraptor and contrast it with a sparrow. There's a remarkable degree of, of structural similarity. Um, obviously the Velociraptor skeleton is a lot bigger uh, and there, there are differences, but you can see that they're very, very similar. And you're talking about a, um, a, a time there of 65 million years or, or, or more. Um, and of course, we know there that there were significant differences that, that just weren't preserved in the fossils. Uh, and yet the skeletons do display a pretty remarkable similarities. There's pretty remarkable conservatism about the, that basic body plan. Um, in my view, this, this point is pretty much correct. Um, but I, I kind of think that this maybe points to a general problem with paleontology rather than a, a, a specific limitation of punctuated equilibrium. I mean, the unfortunate fact is that the evidence available in paleontology is often extremely weak compared to the evidence available in other sciences. Um, as we've emphasised many times, the basic source of data, the fossil record, is severely incomplete. So the kinds of problems we've seen here are going to apply to almost any macroevolutionary hypothesis. Um, I mean, I suppose one option is simply to abstain from engaging in macroevolutionary theory. I think that would be foolish. The fossil record might not be good evidence, but there's still evidence there, and it would be silly to ignore it. We just have to be aware of the difficulties and aware that claims based on the fossil record have to be made much more tentatively than claims in other sciences. But nevertheless, I think... I mean, the, the kind of conservative uh, stasis that you find um, in, in punctuated equilibrium, you're looking for uh, fossils that have pretty much no change at all. And if you can look at a um, forms of a skeleton uh, over, say, 10 million years, and the skeleton skeletons change hardly at all, there are barely any changes whatsoever, uh, I think you have to say that that's that does seem to be stasis. I mean, stasis seems a reasonable assumption there. So we can make more or less reasonable hypotheses, even if we don't get um, the sort of knockdown arguments that you might get, the sort of knockdown evidence that you might get in other sciences. Um, okay, a more serious charge is that punctuated equilibrium can be tested, but that it's failed those tests. So, first of all, speciation often occurs with little or no change. We know from organisms in the modern world that there are many cryptic species, species which look so similar to each other that they were originally classed as the same species. Here's an example from butterflies. These are two different species. Uh, very, very similar. Here's an even more striking example. These are two different species of butterfly. Um, you have to look pretty hard to see the differences there. And here are two different species of salamander from uh, Wikipedia, uh, which look the same but are actually quite distantly related. Cases like this are fairly common. Um, in, in, in most cases, uh, identifying a new species requires being an expert in the field. It requires knowing very small and precise differences to look for. So clearly, many speciation events will occur with barely any morphological changes. Now, since paleontologists can only classify species based on their morphology, well, obviously, they'll miss these events, and that will give us the illusion that speciation is all, always accompanied by significant change. But it's not. Okay? We know that, in fact, uh, speciation is not accompanied by significant change, uh, so punctuated equilibrium is refuted. Most speciation events involve very, very little change. This criticism is based on a simple confusion. Punctuated equilibrium claims that almost all macroevolutionary change occurs during speciation. It doesn't claim that almost all speciation produces macroevolutionary change. Okay, so this is a, a simple logical point. Most x follows from y doesn't entail most y produces x. If I say that almost all Ebola infections cause death, 
This doesn't entail that almost all deaths have been caused by Ebola. Or if I say that almost all fans of the Grateful Dead are on psychedelic drugs, this doesn't entail that almost all people who take psychedelic drugs are fans of the Grateful Dead. So to say that many speciation events occur with very little morphological change doesn't at all threaten punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium only claims that uh, most evolutionary change occurs during speciation events. Second, some people have pointed out that genetic changes seem to develop in a gradual and steady manner. So when we actually look at the underlying genomes of a species, we see that these change gradually and steadily. Uh, and this fact actually provides the basis for a very important tool in paleontology, the molecular clock. The molecular clock is a tool for determining time, for determining the age of a species or the time when one species diverged from another. Um, so, so DNA uh, is a polymer consisting of a, a long series of nucleotides. Each nucleotide has one of four possible bases, cytosine, guanine, adenine or thymine. Um, and this is what makes up the genome, the genetic code. Mutations in the genome involve adding a nucleotide, deleting a nucleotide or substituting one nucleotide for another. The basic idea of the molecular clock is that nucleotide substitutions occur at a reasonably constant rate. So we can use the degree of divergence between two or more nucleotide sequences to help determine the timing of evolutionary events. Uh, so uh, let's suppose we have DNA sequences from two different species, sequences which we know have a common ancestry because they're very similar, um, because they code for the same genes or whatever. Well, by simply counting the number of differences between these two sequences, we can make an estimate of when the two species diverged. And this turns out to work fairly well. Here's a figure from Futuyama's evolution textbook. The x-axis is time, and uh, the y-axis is the number of nucleotide substitutions. The black line represents the, the estimated time of divergence given by the molecular clock, um, and the, the red and green dots represent uh, pairs of living species who diverged at the, at the time shown based on fossil evidence. So this dot is a pair of species who we know from fossil evidence diverged uh, about 90 million years ago. Um, this dot is a pair of species who we know diverged about 75 million years ago. Now as you can see the molecular clock is pretty accurate. It's not perfect but it's, it's pretty good. Now, obviously, if we know from the fossil record when species diverged, we don't need molecular clocks. But there are many species whose divergence isn't represented in the fossil record. So if we have a pair of species for which the fossil record is absent, we can look at their DNA sequences. And let's say we had 25 nucleotide substitutions. Well, we can predict that they probably diverged about 30, maybe, or 27, or whatever, million years ago. Uh, now, the basis of molecular clocks clearly undermines punctuated equilibrium. For molecular clocks to be reliable, we need genetic changes to tick in a reasonably steady fashion, in a, in a clock-like fashion. So stops and starts, stasis and punctuations, that, um, that completely undermines their reliability. But as you've just seen from that graph, molecular clocks uh, do seem to be reasonably accurate. Uh, again, this criticism rests on a confusion. Punctuated equilibrium concerns the evolution of phenotypes, not genotypes. The genotype-phenotype distinction, if you're not familiar with it, uh, it's fairly simple. The genotype of an organism is its genetic information that was passed on to it from its parents. It's the genes that are encoded by its, its DNA and contained in its cells. The phenotype of an organism is its physical characteristics. Now importantly, a difference in the genotype doesn't imply a difference in the phenotype. Um, a great deal of genetic change is neutral. The majority of mutations make no difference to an organism's fitness. Um, the genomes of many species, especially eukaryotes, contain large amounts of non-coding DNA. Uh, that's DNA that doesn't seem to have any function for the organism. Obviously mutations in these sequences uh, will make no difference. Even in DNA that does code for, uh, for proteins and that maybe performs essential functions, mutations can be neutral. This is because of the degeneracy of the genetic code. Proteins are built out of amino acids, and in DNA, a sequence of three nucleotides called codons corresponds to each amino acid. Uh, 
and there are 64 possible codons but only 20 amino acids. So different codons code for the same amino acid. For instance, amino acid serine is coded by TCT, TCC, TCA and TCG. Now a mutation from TCT to TCC, that's obviously going to make no difference to the phenotype. <coughs> now neutral mutations tend to occur at a fairly constant rate, as should be expected. Um, most mutations that become fixed in a species are, are neutral ones. This is the basis of the molecular clock. But these neutral mutations make no difference to the phenotype. We shouldn't uh, necessarily expect the evolution of the genotype and the evolution of the phenotype to proceed according to the same kinds of patterns. Even if change in the genetic code occurs at a constant and gradual rate, this doesn't falsify punctuated equilibrium, which, which concerns phenotypic change. It concerns the sorts of changes of morphology that we observe in the fossil record. It's entirely possible that the genotype exhibits steady change, while the phenotype exhibits rapid change followed by stasis. And this is because the genotype um, can change significantly without affecting the phenotype. One point that uh, Gould makes in the structure of evolutionary theory, and I completely agree with him on this, uh, is we have to be wary of, of kind of reductionistic attitudes that might lead us to assume that genetic changes are somehow fundamental. Uh, Adaptation and Natural Selection by George Williams and The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins are probably the most famous examples of very reductionistic approaches to evolution. Williams and Dawkins claim that all selection operates on the gene, operates on the, the, the level of the, of the gene. And that's a perfectly respectable theory, but um, even if we adopt this gene's eye view, we shouldn't forget that we can look at evolution at other levels as well. Gradual change on the genetic scale in no way uh, impugns or downgrades punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium uh, simply doesn't say anything about the genetic scale. The third criticism is empirical refutation by cases in the fossil record. This is the claim that if you look at the fossil record, you actually tend to find gradualism, not the kinds of patterns consistent with punctuated equilibrium. I think this is probably the most uh, difficult criticism to discuss because it's hard to know how to judge the opposing sides here. Um, I mean, obviously, you can't refute punctuated equilibrium by pointing to a few examples of gradual change. And similarly, you can't confirm it by pointing to a few examples of rapid change in stasis. In fact, even if you were to do like a, a massive meta-analysis of various different studies of fossils, there would still be debates about whether the right kinds of studies were included. So all I can do really is, is, is offer some suggestive points and, and then maybe recommend that you do further reading. Um, so first of all, it is a simple fact that many studies have found gradualism. If you were to tabulate all of the studies that have been done on fossils, many of them would show gradual changes. Um, maybe even more than half of them would show gradual changes. However, a point that Gould repeatedly emphasises in uh, structure evolutionary theory is that this is almost certainly due to bias in past paleontological practice. Before punctuated, punctuated equilibrium, uh, paleontologists worked on the assumption that evolution means gradual change. And so if gradual change can't be found, this can only be due to incompleteness in the fossil record. Obviously, there's no point doing detailed studies on fossil lineages that are so incomplete that they contain no information about large-scale evolution. Uh, and if, if a, a lineage didn't display gradual change, the assumption was it contains no information about large-scale evolution. So paleontologists tended to focus on lineages that displayed gradual change. Gould, Gould cites a particularly striking example with the Graffaea, uh, a, a Triassic oyster that was frequently cited as a classic example of evolution in the fossil record. I showed you this image in the last video. Gould actually says that this image is a distortion and that even this, uh, when you analyse this properly, this displays stasis. Um, but the more striking point, and I quote, uh, this, this um, is the Graffaea. This is uh, apparently a case of gradual change. But um, Gould says, I quote, more than 100 other species of mollusks, many with records as rich as Graffaea's, occur in the same Liassic rocks, yet no one ever documented the stratigraphic history of even a single one in any study of evolution, for all demonstrate stasis. Uh, 
scientists picked out the only species that seemed to illustrate gradualism. Nobody bothered recording stasis because stasis wasn't interesting. Um, it was seen, it, the, the view was that stasis doesn't demonstrate evolution, stasis only suggests that the fossil records are incomplete. So we have to be very careful when we look at paleontological research, especially research from before the 1970s. There are a great many cases of gradualism, but it might be that these gradualistic lineages um, were uh, sort of uh, a few standout lineages in um, kind of rocks where maybe 90, 95, maybe even 95, 99% of the other lineages display stasis. Um, okay, now with that said, I'm going to leave you here. We'll look at some specific uh, claims of empirical refutation in the next video, which I will upload tomorrow. But for now, goodbye.